Now we go to a very cultured architect, uh, someone who studied for more than four years uh, with his own importance for architecture. I'm talking about Owen, jo Owen Jones, who <clears throat> died today, I mean, on, on April 19th. And uh, he's important because uh, he also, just like Ferdinand uh, Cheval, he's showing us something that um, most of the time we forget. That is the rich, complex, intricate, and maybe unavoidable world of ornaments. Uh, so this was the man, you know, uh, Victorian England, and, uh, you know, as opposed to poor Ferdinand Cheval, he was, uh, as you can see, a member of the elite, uh, an accomplished man, uh, you know, uh, dressed accordingly, and so on. So Owen Jones was an English-born Welsh architect, a versatile architect and designer. He was also one of the most influential design theorists of the 19th century. <clears throat> well, he might have been, but today he's completely forgotten. I mean, not everywhere. <clears throat> but here where I'm talking from, he is. He helped pioneer modern color theory and his theories on flat patterning, patterning and ornament still resonate with contemporary designers today. Again, not here. Here, we don't talk at all about ornament at all. The very word does not exist. He rose to preeminence with his studies of Islamic decoration at the Alhambra and the associated publication of his drawings, which pioneered new standards in chromolithography. Jones was a pivotal, pivotal figure in the formation of the South Kensington uh, museum, later to become the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, through his close association with Henri Cole, the museum's first director, and another key figure in 19th century design reform. We see the word reform. Well, most of the creators we talk about did just that, reform. Le Corbusier, you remember what Le Corbusier wrote about, révolution ou architecture. He wanted to revolutionize or reform life through architecture. And, and most architects that made it into the pages of the history of architecture were reformers, were revolutionaries, if you want to use this word. Jones was also responsible for the interior decoration and layout of exhibits for the great exhibition building of 1851 and for its later incarnation in Sydenham. Uh, Jones advised on the foundation collections for the South Kensington Museum and formulated decorative arts principles which became teaching frameworks for the government, uh, government school of design then at Marlborough House. These design propositions also formed the basis for his seminal publication, The Grammar of Ornament, the global and historical design source book for which Jones is perhaps, perhaps best known today. Jones believed in the search for a modern style unique to the 19th century, radically different from the prevailing aesthetics of neoclassicism and the Gothic revival. He looked towards the Islamic world for much of this inspiration, using his studies of Islamic decoration of the Alhambra to develop theories on flat plat patterning geometry and abstraction in ornament. So I'll show uh, some of his works, but also some of the influences he, uh, he received. Alhambra ornaments. Again, just like in the case of uh, Ferdinand Cheval, what makes men want decoration or ornaments? You know, and why is it that us today, in some parts of the world at least, we totally reject this. In my opinion, we reject a part within ourselves which exists and it which is buried. And I think uh, sooner or later um, uh, a change will occur. And it is already occurring. Uh, you know, Alhambra. Who would say that there is no, there is no beauty here? You know, there is beauty here. You know, there, there is character. 
can we see ourselves contemplate in, uh, in, uh, in rapture a blank white wall? I doubt it. A blank white wall is a blank white wall, and you cannot have uh, reveries, you know, to, to use a French word, you know, staring at a white wall. It's impossible. I mean, you know, space could be very well proportioned, yes, but it's not enough space, you know, just space. Look here, you know, it, it, it is a surface, yes, but it is a surface which communicates something and it's in, 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 in its intricacies uh, is rich, you know. Uh, our white walls are not like this. We have to confess, they are not. But, but, but then we hang on the white wall pictures, more or less wild. You know, that's why we need pictures, you know, canvases, because the white walls are unbearable otherwise. So we hang uh, pictures on our white walls and we keep creating white walls and then we keep commissioning artists or purchasing paintings to hang them on the walls, pictures, because the white wall in itself is not sufficient. It's not here in such a building, you don't need to hang pictures on the walls because the wall is already rich enough. Maybe too rich, some might say, but look at this. You know, the Islamic world was, was uh, capable of expressing unbelievable, unbelievable complexities in an abstract way that normally anyone would say is, is astonishing. And it is astonishing. You know, we, we looked at the work of Ferdinand Cheval and we look at this work. In a way, there are no big differences. There you had a single man do what he, his dream was. And here we had, uh, you know, maybe great craftsmen working uh, with uh, great master builders, erecting a public building, not an individual building, like in the case of Ferdinand Cheval. Although Ferdinand Cheval achieved a building that uh, whose meaning goes beyond uh, you know, the particularities of the single peasant who with four uh, years of study in school. But in both cases, there is a, a richness which is undeniable, which is obvious, which is uh, visually, uh, you know, uh, uh, persuasive and, 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 and yet in many parts of the world today, we continue to build our white walls. Sterile, frigid, call them as you want. We keep doing it. And we keep being unhappy, I, I would say, because what do we actually create with uh, those white walls? Uh, not much, really. As long as we divorce structure from ornament, we cannot build significantly. I don't think so. You need both. You need structure and ornament. And uh, this is shown in the history of architecture from the very beginning. Now, he published this very famous book, Grammar, Grammar of Ornament, which probably should be on the tables of every architect together, maybe with Neufer. But unfortunately, we only have no effort and we, we don't even think in case we know of this book, of having this book near Neufert's book. It's not maybe a great book in the sense it's a source book. It's a collage of various images, you know. It's, it's uh, uh, maybe not a very creative work, but it is an attempt to bring to our attention the richness of the ornamental and decorative world. And as such, I think is important. Maybe it is too agglomerate, you know, too busy, you know, the page, too many. He wanted to say too much in, in, a, in a small space, uh, which is understandable. You know, he, it's an encyclopedia of ornaments. That's what it is. But it shows clearly that uh, the white wall for the, the majority of, 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 of achievements in the field of architecture was uh, the white wall was not uh, was not an option.
You know, even Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, he died, but he said that uh, he only studied a year in college and strangely, he studied calligraphy. For some reason, he chose to study calligraphy and everybody mocked him and, and you know, he was asked, why would you study calligraphy? What is calligraphy, uh, you know, helping you with, you know? And, and he realized some years later when he, uh, you know, invented uh, and, and built the first uh, co personal computer, Mac Plus or Mac 5, 512 or something like this, he said that actually that year of studying calligraphy, the, the so-called useless calligraphy, helped him do the interface uh, of, 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 of the first uh, computer. So, you know, what appears to be useless could have a function at one point in your life or another. So I would say that there is a lot of usage for what appears to be so-called useless. But in order to have the courage to state something like this, we have to uh, be open to what is called the contemplative life, vita contemplativa. If we are not open to contemplation, then of course we don't see any value in studying calligraphy or doing ornaments because we don't contemplate anything. We only act, act and act again, but it's an empty kind of uh, acting because the white wall without any signs or traces of contemplation is simply not sustaining life, I think, uh, uh, sufficiently. Even if we hang uh, wild pictures, let's say uh, abstract expressionist paintings on the walls and the whiter the walls, the wilder, the, uh, the pictorial dreams that we hang on those white walls. So Owen Jones trying to, uh, uh, you know, show to us the, the, the fascination he had, he felt vis-a-vis -vis ornaments. Now, this I showed before, sorry, I mean, if, if you saw them, these are my own drawings done exactly with that first Apple computer that Steve Jobs, that I mentioned, invented and built. And I'm still not ashamed of them. I knew nothing about computers. They were in black and white. But by just playing with it, I generated these, uh, you know, images, call them images, which are ornamental in nature, yes. I was scribbling with, a, with my first computer and that's what I got. And back to uh, pages from uh, the grammar of ornament, uh, you know, I think there is satisfaction to be found in the intricacies of a well done uh, ornament. Uh, that's, this is what I feel. And I wonder why the schools of architecture avoid to, uh, you know, uh, address uh, the, 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 this complexity, uh, you know, to ask the students, why don't you try to create a new ornament or to lose yourself in contemplation, drawing an ornament just like uh, Louis Sullivan did, and I will end this presentation on Owen Jones uh, with, uh, with, with, with some examples from uh, Sullivan's work. And, and it's not just the ornament, but it's also the color. The color, yes, is important, the color, and the co we avoid the color as well. So now Louis Sullivan ornaments, Louis Sullivan being the father of modern architecture or one of the fathers of modern architecture, or certainly one of the fathers of modern architecture in North America. But he also created, this is Sullivan, he also created a, an unbelievable uh, ornament. And I will show some examples as I did so in the past of his ornaments. What made the man who said form follows function create these ornaments. 
But just like in the case of Ferdinand Cheval and in the case of uh, Owen Jones, he understood that there was a reality in life and in his soul and in the visual world that needed to be expressed. And he expressed it, uh, I would say, uh, mostly through ornaments, more than through the Cartesian structure of the office tower. I see no contradiction between what he did, between Ferdinand che what che Ferdinand Cheval did, and Owen Jones tried to uh, illustrate in his grammar of ornament. Unfortunately, we are here, I don't know, 10 people or so out of the few thousands I send the invitation. Those other thousands of people will remain continually convinced that working with white cubes is all there is to architecture. It's not. I'm sorry to disappoint them. It's not. So he used terracotta. Terracotta is lighter and easier to work with than stone masonry. Sullivan used it in his architecture because it had a malleability that was appropriate for his ornament. Probably the most famous example is the riving green ironwork that covers the entrance canopies of the Carson Pyre Scott store on South State Street in Chicago. I don't know if I have an image here with this, but let's hope I do. These ornaments often executed by the talented young draftsman in, in Sullivan's employ would eventually become Sullivan's trademark to students of architecture. They are his instantly recognizable signature. 